Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Music Den. I'm your host, Armando Venditti. Hoping you guys are having a good day. And again, that you're looking after yourselves and one another. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, with day nine of our 31 perfect albums. I'm joined again by Mr. Bill Schuster. How's it going, Bill? I am great, Armando. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. I am also joined by Mr. Ken Cheshire. How's it going, Ken? Good morning. Doing great. Thank you for having me. Anytime, anytime. And the one and only, Mr. Jim Bricker. How are you doing, Jim? I'm I'm doing fine. Doing fine. Thank you, Armando. <laughs> I always love that look on your face. You don't know when to say when I refer to you as the one and only. <laughs> I yes. I'm gonna have to come up with something. Oh, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Um, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we are going through our 31 perfect albums. That's perfect albums, all killer, no filler. We have, again, um, well, some of us have had difficulty with our lists. Uh, Bill has said that at last count before he brought it down to 31, he had 64 albums on his list. And he had to bring that down to 31. He said it was something like, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it had to do with something about telling which kid he loved the most. <laughs> you know? Personally, again, I wouldn't have that issue myself, but that's just me. Right? I'm, I'm funny that way. So we will give you our uh, selection number nine for um, our 31 perfect albums. And we're going to start with Mr. Bill Schuster. All right. Thank you, Armando. Uh, I'm going to stay in 1973, where I was in the last episode, but this is a complete left turn from uh, Harry Nielsen. And apologies in advance, but my wife's going to know exactly what this album is because she told me I had to do it. Chicken train, running all day. You can't get on, you can't get off. Chicken train, take the chickens away. Bark, bark. Bark, 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 bark. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, catch Bell show at 9 p.m. It gets a little blue, all right? That's the <laughs> Mountain Daredevil's <laughs> debut album. Uh, when we kept chickens... We always sang that song to the chickens, and we made a running family joke about it and did the goofy oh. So when she saw my list last night, she said, you have to do the chicken train. So really, you know, Stacy, you're welcome. I've humiliated myself. In Thank you, Stacy. This is going to go over you. well. I can. <laughs> All right. That, that is just one aspect of this debut album, though. Yeah, they... Uh, they have the the goofy corn pone stuff. They have lots of harmonica and mouth harp, and uh, but they also have some uh, absolutely gorgeous ballads. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably most famous for oh, this album. If you want to get to heaven, was the the big song on the rock stations, and the follow up album had Jackie Blue, which was very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and gave a lot of people the wrong idea about the Ozark Mountain Daredevils because I'm sure when they got the album and heard some of the more uh, really rustic countryfied stuff they might have been a little shocked after hearing jackie blue but uh yeah this uh, starts out with country girl which is has always been a favorite of mine but my absolute favorite ozark mountain daredevil song is the second song on here uh, written by larry lee it's spaceship orion which is just a simple gorgeous ballad about us uh, pretty much the last man on earth being picked up and taken away by aliens that's how i interpret the song so he was uh presaging dennis de young and come sail away here <laughs> and then uh yeah if you want to get to heaven as the single is next then the aforementioned chicken train the now infamous chicken train yes. uh, and it closes with the uh, colorado song which used to have a special meaning to me because uh, as a teenager i lived in colorado for a few years and I came back here to Illinois and I intended to always go back to Colorado. I never did, but I sang the song a lot. There's a line in there. I'm going back to Colorado. And it took on a personal meaning, but it's just a lovely song. And yeah, side two, standing on the rock. It's a lot more. I was standing on the rock, waiting for the wind to blow. And yeah, they these guys really... I mean, it's in the name, Ozark Mountain. They're not playing. These guys are authentic uh, 
here they are hanging out on the porch, nine of them in total. Ladies and gentlemen, the dogs did deliverance. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they wrote some great songs. Uh, there were a number of songwriters in the band, a number of vocalists, so they had a nice variety to them. And I really appreciate their whole 70s catalog, but this remains my favorite. This is the only country rock album I have on my list. I, I had some others I was considering, but yeah, this one, it's very unique, just like the Ozark Mountain Daredevils themselves. So if you want to get beyond, if you want to get to heaven and Jackie Blue, this is the place to start by all means. Yeah. It's a good choice. Yeah, if you want to get to heaven is my favorite, um, harm, one of my favorite harmonica songs. Nice. You know, that intro is just amazing. Yeah. And then it only gets better from there. So, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that album quickly. Just, uh, you did mention that album on another show we did a few months back. Yeah. We've done quite that a few was, shows. but It uh, was on our uh, 1973 top five albums. That's right. That's right. That's right. Good choice. Good choice. All right. Off to Ken for your choice. Okay, we're going to head on into June of 78 with the debut album um, produced by one of my favorite producers' name, Muff Winwood. Anybody guess? Okay. Dire Straits. Uh, charted nice. number two in the U.S. Um, two singles, Sultans of Swing and Water of Love. Um, this was my introduction to um, uh, for a guitarist to have a uh, a style of playing that was picking rather than using a pick. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it's uh, if this is the case, but I went on from there to really um, appreciate the picking style of of like Jimmy Messina and especially Stephen Stills. Because uh, through that guitar technique, you, 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 can't, you can't imitate that with, you know, playing with a guitar pick, you know. Um, and when you listen to the album, you know, it starts off with Down to the Waterline, Water of Love, Setting, uh, setting Me Up. Each song... You know, you don't know where it's going to go from there on first listen. Um, the songs have a, um, uh, like you said on another album, Armando. There's a there's a thread that runs through it uh, of sound and style. Yet the songs um, they don't sound like one another. And uh, again, an artist uh, saving uh, the hit single or the second side of the album rather than starting off with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Sultans of Swing, uh, in the gallery, Wild West Inn, and to close with Lions, uh, this album uh, blew me away. And this is one of the reasons why um, when I, uh, after I graduated high school and went to, and put aside my, second hand cheap electric guitar i went for went for the stratocaster because i just love that sound so much and i still do it's still the only electric guitar that i have and um mm -hmm. so so yeah this is um was a big influence on me as a musician and um is it one of the most amazing debut albums that i've ever heard Yeah, um, it is a good album. I, I I said to to Bell that you know on another episode we did months back that uh, "Sultans of Swing" was really the only song that I, that really connected with me. But it it is a good album overall. Like I've listened to it again, and it, I do like it. To me, that sound just quickly, that style of playing was the total opposite of what was going on, you know, like I said to Jim, like with bands like Boston and you know Queen and you know the and and right. Mark Knopfler couldn't stand 
groups like Boston. You know, he just wanted to do a complete opposite of what was going on on the radio at that point in time. Uh, and of course, at that point, Boston had don't look back. We won't even go there. But that's another issue altogether, you know. Um, so, yeah, well, it's a good choice. Good choice. All right. Over to me. The man of the hour. Man of the hour. Okay. Um, <laughs> Again, this is one that's sort of like a no-brainer that if it's not on everyone's list, it was excised from their list to make room for other things that probably needed a bit more attention. Um, but yeah, um, it, it's a boring one. Dark Side of the Moon, 1973, Pink Floyd. I mean, it's... <clears throat> Where have I heard that before? Oh, I'm sorry, go on. I know. It's not the first time we've talked about it here. Um, it is It is flawless. I, I You know, I, I don't know someone who's listened to side one and had just not been like, oh my gosh, what kind of experience have I just gone through? It is, it, it moves, you know, albums into the realm of an experience. Um, it's pretty much a game changer uh, again, where sort of like, okay, the gauntlet's been thrown down. Now you have this to kind of compare to. And, um, and no, not only did other artists have to sort of live up to it, but Pink Floyd had to live up to it as well, which could not have been an easy task. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it's been talked about, you know, to death um, for, for good reason. It's, it's an essential album. It's perfect. Uh, Yawn. I just because it's such such an obvious pick, but um, it just had it just had to be there on my list. Could could not be denied. The Pink Floyd with their Dark Side of the Moon. Okay. Yeah, nice. you were exactly right. Uh, I did excise it from my list, but if I was doing my top ten favorite, you know, the Desert Island thing, it would absolutely be in the top five. Um, now I'll, I'll throw the super tramp question back at you guys that was asked about super tramp is pink floyd prog art rock myself prog adjacent uh, what was that ken sorry prog adjacent oh okay so prog-esque kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay how about we call it gorp it's not prog it's gorp <laughs> Okay. okay, I don't know why that sounded good at the moment, but they kind of became a put your they, they over a came. to the side. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good choice. That's a really good choice. Um, but uh, I mean, I'm so I'd be surprised if it wasn't on at least one of our lists in terms of of this list because you know I've I've said before in other episodes that I. I put Dark Side of the Moon neck and neck with Wish You Were Here. Um, Fair enough. But, I mean, in even saying that, I, I would even just put maybe Wish You Were Here just slightly by a, you know, whatever hair is not on my head. Just like, you know, um, half a hair ahead of Dark Side of the Moon. But, when you look at, when you look at the album Dark Side of the Moon and you listen to the just the quality of the of the recording, the music that's on there, and the way it's laid out, it is a perfect album. So um, they just continued it for me with Wish You Were Here, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> I won't go any further. Uh, we must carry on, ladies and gentlemen. My pick for day nine is Queen with the Day at the Races. Okay. Released December 10th, 1976. This album is considered the bastard cousin of A Night at the Opera, uh, the companion album to go with A Night at the Opera. Album cover is pretty much the same, just done in black. And, you know, in terms of the graphics, a little change here and there. Albums are both named after, you know, Marx Brothers movies. But you know what? It, and in terms of the sound of the album, in terms of the music, the music was recorded pretty much around the same time, you know, between both albums. Brian May has said in past interviews that he he has had envisioned maybe these albums being released as a double album package collection mm -hmm. at one point in time. 
It is for me sublime. Ten tracks and all. Starts off with tie your mother down and the the quote from the Times newspaper on the inside album uh, sleeve is, and I quote, uh, sheer bloody poetry. You know, you have the gong introduction and then you have the guitar line from White Man and then it goes into this, you know, crashing of chords that come in and this sort of like, um, Brian May called it sort of like going up an escalator to heaven kind of thing, right? You know, that sort of dreamy kind of section that comes after. And then the guitar hits at like 103 into the track. And it's like, bloody hell. I mean, this song dates back to like 1971. And it's just brutal. It just goes for the throat and it doesn't let go. Um, it's unfortunate that this was released as the second single after somebody to love, but it is rock perfection with heavy guitars, heavy drums, and uh, beautiful harmony vocals. Then it goes into the melodic, poetic, uh, You Take My Breath Away, which was recorded. The album was released in December. It was recorded in September. This song was featured at the free concert in Hyde Park. It wasn't even recorded yet, and they, they played it live. Then it goes into um, Long Way, which was a third single that was released in Canada, but failed, uh, featuring a beautiful vocal by uh, Brian May. Then one of the two tour de forces on this album, The Millionaire Waltz. Okay, beautiful, beautiful track. You know, three, four time on the piano and the bass and uh, just a very effortless vocal done by... Freddie Mercury dedicated to John Reed, the manager at the time, who also managed Elton John. But then you get into the rock section, but it's done in 12-8 time on the middle. And it's just, pardon my language again, fucking amazing. Just brutal. And Freddie Mercury's vocals come in white hot over all the guitar overdubs and the drums. His vocals just come in searing over the, over the guitar, like right, cuts right through the guitar. It's just amazing. And then it goes back into the 3-4 section of the rest of the track. Album ends off on side one um, with the playful You and I pop, basically your pop confection track, perfection confection track, which written by John Deacon, which was the B-side to uh, Tie Your Mother Down. Side two starts off with Somebody to Love gospel, pastiche, all over the place, unabashed, unapologetic. It is what it is. Beautiful harmony vocals done by the by the three of them, by May, Taylor, and Mercury. Goes into the B-side of uh, the single for somebody to love, White Man. Heavy is all get up, bombastic, heavy guitars, very one of the more most political tracks that they've ever done. Uh, then it goes into the whimsical uh, Good Old Fashioned Lover Boy, featuring, uh, you know, background vocals by Mike Stone, their engineer. Then it goes into Drowse, which for me, when I first heard it, I really didn't, it was, a, it's a Roger Taylor composition. Um, I really didn't like it when I first heard it as a kid, but it, it's grown on me quite a bit. And I don't know what they did with the production, with the drums, but the drums are sort of like underplayed in the mix. Um, and there's a lot of slide guitar Beautifully done. And it's just a sort of the vocal delivery done by Taylor on this track. It's just it 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 it's very atmospheric. It paints a picture. You know, um, if you know the lyrics to the first verse, you know. Um, and then it goes into the last track, uh, Teo Toriate, Let Us Cling Together, which the, the the choruses are done in Japanese, and the track was dedicated to their Japanese fans because they were white hot in Japan at this point. And it's very beautiful, very poetic, very sad, very emotional track. Um, <clears throat> and then it basically ends off with the intro that was for Tie Your Mother Down, sort of like, which bookends the album. It is perfect. From track one to track 10, I would not skip one song on this album. I was going to pick an anti-opera 
you know, but I think this album is just as good as an at the opera. I think it deserves a little more attention. I think it does get slagged off quite a bit and undeservedly so. So that's my um, pick for day nine, A Day at the Races by Queen, 1976. So you, you were talking about not liking the drows with Roger. I think that was true for me when I was younger and first getting into Queen too. Was I didn't like hardly any of the Roger songs. Uh, yeah. It wasn't until years later that I really started picking up what Roger was putting down vocally and just with his whole style of songwriting. Uh, yeah, well, even just the lead off of, uh, lyric on the yeah. on drows, it, it, uh, it goes. It's a sad-eyed goodbye yesterday moments I remember. The bleak street, weak need partings I recall. Not that I know the song, by the way. But, <laughs> I mean, it's just the way he delivers it. It, 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 he, it. He sort of delivers that kind of like behind the music, kind of like behind the drums, kind of like laid back, like a step, like a beat behind what's going on musically. And he, it just, he delivers it in such a way that for me, when I hear it, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, like Sunday afternoon, it's a summer day, you've got nothing to do, you're bored out of your mind, but you know what, you got the radio <laughs> on, and that's sort of carrying you through the day kind of thing. That's what con what it conjures up for me when I listen to that song. And again, Teo Teriate, the last track, it's like, oh, forget about it, I'm done. You know, like, it, it's very emotional, you know. Um so yeah, that's my uh, again my pick for day nine. Very good. Yeah. Is there any uh, comments, Jim, or any questions? <laughs> I see you nodding. I'm, I'm I'm kind of absorbing it because I'm my knowledge of the Queen catalog outside of their <laughs> singles is just limited. So I don't have a lot to add to it other than you know this makes me want to go and dip dip my Go waist deep into the couple of albums that you've mentioned from Queen as part of this Perfect 31 series. So I'm I'm taking it in. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, I just in closing, my first album from Queen was the original Greatest Hits. Right? That came out in 81 with the four of them on the cover. And I listened to the album. I remember it was like it was May 13. When was it? May 12th, 1982. It was a Friday. And my brother-in-law, again, Mario, gave me a copy of the cassette to listen to. And I, I had a day off school. I listened to it. And it was just like, like, what the hell? Like, what is this? And I went out. I bought all the albums after that. I was like, I got to get this. I made people listen to these albums because, you know, being in the house, I, you know, like, oh, I got to listen you know, like it was just I fell hook line and sinker. So yeah. Yeah. So anyways, there you go, guys. Our um, another episode in the can for 31 perfect albums, day nine. Again, please put your comments down below uh of your uh perfect albums. Okay. Um again, no right or wrong answers, just opinions. And again, we would like to get a dialogue going on this subject because you know what it's a hell of a subject and it's fun to do so yes. you know so for uh bill jim and ken i am armando signing off and uh, we'll see you soon for episode 10 have a good day take care of yourselves and one another bye for now <laughs>